Today we have a busy webinar, so I will just go right ahead with the presentation. And my presentation is about uh, endometrioma as an endless uh, dilemma. Uh, endometriosis generally is classified into four types, and our talk today is about uh, endometrioma. The classic picture of endometrioma is a circumscribed cyst with homogeneous ground glass appearance and thick wool. But endometrioma is a heterogeneous spectrum to, of disorders. You cannot speak about one endometrioma. The origin is different. Genomic alterations are different. Lining of endometrioma varies, so it is occupied by endometrioid tissue. In some cases, 10%, some others, 90%. Ultrasound images varies also, and associated peritoneal or and deep endometriosis also, the incidence varies in different types of endometrioma. So we cannot speak about one, one in the in endometriosis. As you can see here in this ultrasound picture, this is a classic endometrioma. The wall is thick and homogeneous ground glass appearance. The second is again thick wall with slight vascularity and heterogeneous content. The third is, uh, has a protruding polyp without vasculature, and the fourth is uh, the suspicious one with a polyp that has vasculature in it. So when we speak about, about endometrioma, we have to be careful which endometrioma are we speaking about. Uh, in fact, basic research, and I cannot speak about basic research in the presence of Bruce Lassie, my mentor and friend and teacher, but the distinguishing, the, the Basic research indicates a potential uh, mediated damage to the ovary induced by endometrium. This is basic uh, research. This damage originates from changes in the endometrial tissue surrounding the, the endometrioma, with the resultant accumulation of toxic material and iron and other uh, metalloproteinases inside uh, the cyst. And because the cyst wall is thin, this content may leak to the ovary and induces specifically fibrosis in the cortical tissue of the ovary, the stroma is affected. And when the stroma is affected, follicular genesis is not appropriate. It decreases in number and it decreases in quality. The hallmark of the basic research studies is the increased uh, reactive oxygen, oxygen species that results in cortical fibrosis, as we've mentioned, but also the presence of an endometrioma in the ovary carries the risk of infection, of follicular fluid contamination, and possibility of complication during pregnancy and possibility of cancer development. So yes, there is basic research indicating that there is damage, but also there is a clinical risk, although the incidence is low. So we have to weigh the risk of untreated endometrioma versus the risk of surgical treatment of endometrioma. This is basic research, but clinical story is different because uh, clinically endometrioma per se do not result in lower AMH uh, values. They don't affect ovarian reserve. This is, a, this is clinical. And endometrioma are not associated with infertility. They, they, they are not a, a risk factor for infertility, endometrioma. Endometriosis, yes, but endometrioma does not increase the risk of uh, infertility. And couple, uh, I think three years ago, ago Professor Bruce Classy, uh, he published uh, this nice debate. I advise you to read this paper. I spent three days reading it and reading it to be able to argue with him. Uh, and in this, uh, Bruce was pro-surgery in, uh, in endometrioma, and of course there is other uh, uh, scientists who were also either with or against surgery in endometrioma. As it regards to the meta-analysis or the evidence, uh, surgical management of endometrioma does not improve uh, pregnancy rate. It doesn't increase the total number of embryos available does not increase the total number of embryos available. Also, it does not improve live birth rate in endometrioma patients. So surgery does not improve outcome of XP. But surgery could have indications 
rapid growth, suspicious features, painful symptoms that are not relieved by medications, uh, and of course, the theoretical risk of potential for rupture in pregnancy, inability to access follicles, etc. There is no big argument with surgery, but of course, endometrioma is a place for individualized treatment, individualized patient care. And if you choose to go with surgery, which one would you do ablation or uh, extirpation or stripping of the cyst wall? All the outcome, uh, pain and pregnancy are better with the stripping of the cyst wall. Ablation results in more pain, more recurrence and less pregnancy. But after stripping, the rate of spontaneous ovulation is lower in the ovary, ovarian reserve decreases and responsiveness to ovarian hyperstimulation uh, during ICSI also is reduced. So if you want surgery, you have to do extirpation of the wall. And if you do extirpation of the wall, then you will end up with problems. So the, the decision to remove or leave the endometrioma is, uh, should be carefully considered. There is high risk of recurrence after surgery. The results are significantly lower after repetitive surgery. Endometrioma surgery before IVF does not increase fertility and the risk of conservative management, of course, uh, infection, follicular fluid contamination, pregnancy complication and cancer development have to be weighed and understood in terms of prevalence to be able to make a, a decision. In women operated for bilateral endometrioma, there is a risk, of course, of more diminishing of ovarian reserve, although the data does not support uh, this idea. So based on the evidence reviewed, it can be concluded that conservative management may actually expose women to four uh, of the following theoretical risk, infection, follicular fluid contamination, high risk of pregnancy and cancer. The first three are very low incidence and the number needed to treat is very low. So this is another argument against uh, surgery. So we, we are apparently in an era of conservative management of endometrioma and, and it is suggested that endometrioma with the mean diameter below four centimeter should not be systematically removed, and this is the recommendation of SRM and ESH. I, I have this, this case, uh, and I'm sorry it seems that the video is not working, uh, but it is a case of bilateral uh, chocolate cyst, obliteration of Douglas pouch, and sliding test is uh, uh, negative, and the patient is 37 years, primary infertility six years, AMH is 1.8 and no previous surgery and no previous IVF, kissing ovaries and obliteration of Douglas pouch. So should we do surgery? Should we do surgery then IVF? Should we do IVF directly or any further uh, workup? So let us start with Professor Bruce Lassi. Can you open for Professor Bruce Lassi? Bruce, please. Yes. So, which, which line of management would you choose for this case? I like uh, a choice that uh, includes doing IVF first to make your embryos and then going back and taking care of the endometriomas if she does not get pregnant or has implantation defects that I'll describe. Of course. If you, if you, do, if you do this, would you be afraid that this will affect the, the ovarian reserve markedly in such a patient so that she will not have a chance again to be pregnant if she is not pregnant in the first IVF? You can always do a second IVF and, and try to get enough embryos so that surgery then is not such a risk. But yeah. this is a difficult case as you... As you it is, uh, yes. It is. Professor Abha, Iftah uh, al-Abha. Um, so, what what um, would you do for this patient? I would agree that I would do IVF first, looking at she's 37 year old, um, you've got low AMH, um, so your ovarian reserve is already affected. If you can reach the ovaries transvaginally, get the eggs out at least, and then 
uh, save them first. So I would do IVF first, absolutely. Professor Sylvia. Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, of ab course. Absolutely, what, what I agree. Do do for this? Uh, I absolutely agree for a conservative management, not doing IVF surgery. First. Yeah. So you would you would do IVF, IVF first? first. IVF. Yeah, I prefer. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the best choice to to manage properly the patient and give her the best chance to get pregnant. Actually, would you do IVF with long suppression, three months suppression, or just long protocol, or antagonist and freeze all, Bruce? Uh, <clears throat> I would be concerned with this low AM AMH that long suppression would would uh, yield very few eggs. So I would not do that. Would you freeze all or just go with fresh transfer? I would freeze all. And when you go for a, for a, for a transfer, would you do suppression before the transfer? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Professor Abha? Muted. Um, so, um, yeah, wait for my presentation for that. <laughs> I suppose for the stimulation. Um, it depends on lots of things, but as you say, the AMH is low, so long down regulation will further suppress, so I wouldn't go for long down regulation here. Um, we collect the eggs, see what the embryo quality is and everything else before we decide to do further. So it will be very much individualized based on her symptoms or other cases. So. Yes, of course. Professor Sylvia? Can you hear me? I would yes. look very properly to the uterus. So it would really be the topic of my presentation, but I yeah, think no. that this, the solution is in the uterus. So I hope to give information more properly about uh, the myometrium, which is very, very important, not just the ovaries to take account in. This brings us to this question and we we'll start with you, Sylvia. Mm. Uh, there is a possibility of deep endometriosis, high possibility of deep endometriosis in this patient. Would it make a difference in management? Well, it's the, the association is very is very high. So if I mean I, I I talk about my personal experience as as I'm doing lots of of ultrasound scan. So when I find an endometrioma, it's very important to look for deep uh, lesions, and in a very high uh, percentage of cases, we can find them. Maybe they are very small. They we can find in the ligaments, in the uterosacral ligaments, or the torus. But usually, if we look, if we really do a mapping of the pelvis, we can find something. So just to make sure that we have all the information. Of course, um, I mean, uh, I'm more in the part of the pre-IVF. Um, staging of the patient rather than the IVF technique in my, from my point of view but to give the proper information to IVF uh, people let's say like that uh, it's very important to know the old picture not just how is the MIH or how many endometrioma how many follicles we have but also which is the situation in the pelvis That's very good Professor Lessi well, I, I, I will get to this in my talk, but uh, okay, some, women, okay, okay. Some, some women with endometriosis are not going to be impacted by their disease and others are, and yeah. uh, we need a way to define which group they belong to. Yeah, okay. So the, the second case is unilateral endometrioma, 31 years, two years infertility, normal male, AMH 2.6, pelvic pain, responsive to medical treatment. She has an, she's coming for infertility. Would you give her medical treatment or surgery or IVF? Professor Lessi. The, um, the pain issue allows you to operate on these patients according to ASRM guidelines, but since she's coming for infertility and her AMH is not exceedingly high, I would feel more comfortable making embryos and doing a freeze-all cycle first as we did or suggested in the last patient uh, before operating on the patient. That's very good. Professor Abha? Uh, 
I would agree with that, that um, I wouldn't operate on this size and it doesn't seem very big to me. And um, her AMH is already low. She's got two years of infertility, pain is responding. So we carry on with IVF, create the embryos, and then we take it from there, depending on whether we do freeze oil or fresh transfer. Professor Sylvia? I think we, we all agree that's the best strategy yeah, all agree. No surgery. Okay, Professor Kortam. Asha. You are? Yes, I do agree. This size is not to be operated upon a surgery. We can proceed directly to IVF, provided that the, uh, there is an access to uh, pick up the oocytes from the ovary. We proceed to this one. And there is a debate here whether to uh, transfer freshly or to freeze all. I would have transfer the embryos fresh transfer. Professor Gabriel. Yes, can you hear me? Well, what I will do is uh, I will explore the uh, tube's patency. If she hasn't had the history of with lipidol, I will do for this and then wait for the therapeutic effect of it. I will also explore whether the patient is able to wait for six or nine months to see the effect of in laparoscopy or not. Otherwise, I will go for IVF directly. Professor Mahdi. Uh, good evening. Uh, as regards this case, if fallopian tubes is patent, both tubes patent, or at least one tube is patent, I can give her a chance for uh, six months of uh, stimul controlled ovarian stimulation with or without uh, IOI. If no pregnancy, go ahead for uh, IVF uh, and the fresh transfer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So in fact, a balanced and shared approach with women uh, taking into consideration all the pros and cons of surgery is currently recommended. And the retrieval of sites sometimes may be difficult. There is a risk of infection if surgery is done or with IVF and there is a risk of hidden malignancy that should be considered in management of patients, of course, but there are no studies to say exactly what is the prevalence of these problems, especially infection and the risk of malignancy. So the first category of patients consists of women presenting with uh, endometrioma and related infertility, and, and we have discussed this. And the second category of patients consists of women presenting with endometrioma with pelvic pain without infertility, and Professor Kortam will discuss this. And lastly, the third category of patients consists of women presenting with endometrioma-related infertility and pelvic pain. And you've uh, discussed this very clearly. And it is clearly that uh, endometrioma is a place for individualized uh, ma uh, patient care that depends on uh, proper characterization of the region and proper characterization of uh, the patient also. And thank you very much. Uh, our next webinar will be next Friday, and we have uh, the director of our webinar will be our friend, Dr. Walid Hamid, and uh, participants of the webinar will be Professor Marco Filicori, who will discuss renogenotropines, and Professor uh, Botros Rez from USA, and Professor Ashok Agarawel from uh, USA, and Professor Medhat Amir, uh, the head of the Department of Andrology in uh, University uh, and myself. Thank you very much.